Okay, so welcome to lesson five, where we start our carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and we look at all of those major uh, hydrocarbon molecules that are gonna be so important to biology, uh, not only with this course, but throughout all of the biology courses that you might take throughout your education career. So when we think about carbohydrates, um, recall that they are going to be named much in the same way that they compose or comprise of their structure, carbo meaning carbon, hydrate meaning water in some capacity. So that gives you an idea of what it's made out of. Uh, the key thing here, or the most important thing with regards to carbohydrates, it is the best energy source for cell to cell, or for cell use. Uh, it, there's no other uh, molecule that provides as much energy as a carbohydrate does for cellular re respiration and energy production. It's structural, uh, it's, it's very, very structurally sound in terms of uh, it can be used to make up many different structures, cellulose and cell walls, cell membranes use, utilize components of carbohydrates to uh, create its support structures and systems, as well as cell-to-cell -cell communication. As we learn more about hormones and cell-to-cell -cell communication throughout this course, you'll start to see why carbohydrates are so important. So when we think about carbohydrates, we need to look at things like simple sugars, specifically mono and disaccharides. Uh, again, monosaccharide, meaning it's gonna be single ringed single ring that's going to be very important for us uh, throughout the day so please note single ring for monosaccharide and if you know your prefixes from uh, any type of chemistry grade 10 or 11 uh, you'll know that mono means one so sugars are typically going to have a chemical formula uh, of this meaning it's going to be ch2o and then in some way shape or form a number or combination of all of those atoms and it's usually going to be uh, at a ratio of one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. So regardless of what carbohydrate we're looking at, it will usually have that ratio of one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. So the key thing here that we need to understand with regards to the uh, structures of all of them, uh, you, when you take note at all the different glyceraldehydes, ribose, fructoses, these are all carbohydrates in some way, shape or form. Uh, the aldehyde, ether or hydroxyl groups all contribute to that structure specifically. So monosaccharides, monosaccharides in living things commonly have about three, five or six carbons. Uh, and it's going to have those prefixes that are associated with the trios, pentose and hexose. And so ultimately, as long as you can recognize the, the number of carbons in a monosaccharide, you'll be able to kind of name it, which I will be giving you some questions where I provide to you the picture or the uh, the structure of a, a sugar, and you'll have to know which one it is. So it's important that you recognize that it's going to have those different types of uh, prefixes involved. So all of these uh, can be found in linear form, but car carbohydrates of five or more, they tend to form rings when they're in water. It's as a result of a reaction between the two functional groups. Uh, and again, that functional group aspect where we looked at the ionic components of functional groups and how they behave, when they are in fact polar, that means that they can start to form those different bonds. And as a result of them forming those bonds, they can change the shape and structure. So again, when we think about the importance of functional groups, it's very important that we recognize that based on that polarity, it can form different structures as a result. So carbons can be numbered from one to six, and it always, always, always will start at the aldehyde group. Okay, so that's why it's so important that we recognize how to uh, identify those functional groups because ultimately at the end of the day when we start to look at the carbon's uh, structure and knowing where the first carbon starts it's going to start at that aldehyde group. Another aspect that uh, we're talking about here is in terms of that slightly positive polar charge um, it's going to be attracted to that slightly negative charge and as a result of that it's going to form that uh, ring structure. So when glucose forms a ring, there are two orientations that are going to be possible for those hydroxyl groups at the first carbon. The first uh, carbon is very important. And again, that's why it's so important that we recognize where to find that first carbon. Uh, alpha and beta glucose are isomers of each other. Isomers have the same chemical formula, but they have a different structural shape. So why is that important, I guess, is the big question. Because at the end of the day, we're going to look at the different structures that they can form. So when we look at something like alpha glucose, it's gonna form starch, which humans can in fact digest. But beta glucose can form cellulose, which humans cannot digest naturally 
So it's very important that we understand that those structural differences do have a larger impact on the larger function of biological uh, structures and biological systems. So it's quite important for us to understand that that difference between alpha glucose and beta glucose, based on where that hydroxyl is placed, uh, it has a huge impact on how uh, our, a body or any living organism can digest and process that sugar. So some common, common uh, monosaccharides that you're going to have to know for this class are uh, alpha glucose, galactose, and fructose. Uh, they are going to have different structural differences that I've highlighted here for you. Some of them are going to be isomers, uh, and that means that they're going to have the same chemical formula, but the structure will be different. So when we look at alpha glucose, it's that position of that hydroxyl group, right? Mm -hmm. The position of those hydroxyl groups here at one and four. When we look at galactose, it's going to be different from that glucose because when we look at that hydrocarbon or sorry, that functional group that's attached here at that four carbon, the hydroxyl group is an isomer. It's moved to a different spot, essentially. So it's an isomer of that glucose. So even though that they're going to have the same chemical formula, it's going to have different structural positions. And then again, when you look at fructose, we have a couple of major differences here. We have the, a different hydroxyl group at the four carbon. Oops, too large. Uh, our six carbon has a different structure as well. And then there is an extra additional functional group attached here as a branching chain of a carbon. And so that the, ultimately the, the key thing here that you need to recognize is that there are going to be different, oops, there are going to be different isomers of each of these monosaccharides. And it's important to recognize that the hydrocarbon or sorry, the functional group placement really depends on how we uh, treat that monosaccharide. So that's monosaccharides, those single ring structures. We looked at a couple of isomers. We're going to now look at disaccharides, which, as you can imagine, as a result of that prefix, it's going to have a double ring structure. So the key thing here that you need to recognize with a disaccharide is that it consists of two monosaccharides, monosaccharides that are joined together. And it's that dehydration synthesis reaction, and it's going to form what's called a glucosidic linkage or bond. The dehydration synthesis reaction, which we looked at yesterday, looks at that formation of water, the removal of water from two monosaccharides to form a disaccharide. So let's look at that in an example of the formation of maltose. So maltose is the formation of two alpha glucoses coming together. The dehydration process hits those hydroxyl groups there, removes the water out, and as a result of that, we're going to form what's called maltose. So it's that one to four alpha glucidic linkage. And we say one to four because that's where the hydroxyl groups are located in those uh, alpha glucose. The hydroxyl group in one at well, the one carbon and the hydroxyl group at the four carbon. So once we perform that dehydration synthesis, once that water is removed, we're going to have that glucosidic bond at the one four carbon place. So the reason why it's so important when we look at these uh, reactions involving carbohydrates, uh, because the linkages are always going to be designated as alpha or beta, and it really depends on that orientation of the hydroxyl group of that first carbon. So we're going to name some bonds that form these disaccharides. Again, the key thing you have to realize here is that we're looking for what uh, which hydroxyl groups are joining together where that dehydration process occurs. So in this case, we're looking at a sucrose, which is a 1,5-alpha glucosidic bond it, because of the carbons that are involved at that glucosidic linkage is the 1 and 5 carbon. And then in the same thing with lactose, it's a 1 and 4 beta glucosidic linkage. And again, it has to do with that orientation of where that hydroxyl group is. I have those arrows pointing up here because we removed that hydroxyl group that was pointing relative to what we're looking at down. So therefore, it's an alpha glucosidic bond. And then the other one where we have it pointing up, it's going to be a beta glucosidic linkage. And again, that's from when we looked at our monosaccharides. Understanding the orientation of that hydroxyl group will help us to name these disaccharides. Um, we're going to talk about how we count the carbons uh, because we talked about in that note earlier. So I'll answer some of those questions again. But again, 
it's ultimately when we look at how we start counting the carbons, we start at that aldehyde group, okay? So starting at that aldehyde group. Okay, let's take a look at some complex carbohydrates, i.e. polysaccharides, uh, because this is where it starts to get into the direct connection to what we're going to be looking at later on in the class. So hundreds or thousands of monosaccharides linked together by glucosidic linkages form polysaccharides. So that monomer becomes a polymer when we go through that process of polymerization, which, uh, as you saw with the formation of disaccharides, that dehydration process happens many, 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 many times over. So glucose becomes a starch after that polymerization process. And this reaction will help form important biological compounds like DNA, proteins, as well as many, many, many other things that we're going to cover in this class. So when we look at polysaccharides, uh, it's important that we take note of that structure. It's going to have hundreds or even thousands of monomers joined together. Uh, it allows for potential hydrogen bonding because there's going to be many, many presence, uh, presence of many, many hydroxyl groups. And those hydroxyl groups, if at any point they lose that hydrogen and they become polar, they can start to do what's called infolding. And then we look at the structure that it is allowed to form uh, due to its polar nature. So if you recall from yesterday's lesson, those three functional groups which can become polar if they are under the correct circumstances, that hydroxyl group can lose that hydrogen and become negatively polar charged. And as a result of that, it can start to form those hydrogen bonds. So that really lends itself to the structures of proteins and enzymes that we're going to look at later today. Ultimately, they can become polar as a result of that. So they are going to be polar, those polysaccharides. And then as a result of that, they will be hydrophilic. Because again, when we think back to how water worked yesterday, uh, if it comes into contact with something that is polar, that means it can disassociate, which means that it will be hydrophilic. And it will be insoluble in water, which is kind of counterintuitive because we talked about polar things. But the key thing here with regards to why polar polysaccharides are insoluble, it's such a large molecule, okay? There are other stronger forces at play here that hold them together. So water can't necessarily disassociate the entire molecule or surround that entire molecule to make that hydration shell. So while it is hydrophilic, it is not insoluble. And this is, this is a common theme you're going to see with regards to proteins and with regards to uh, polysaccharides, that hydrophilic nature, which allows for it to interact with water, but it won't be uh, soluble, meaning that hydration shell cannot surround it. So that's kind of like a, a weird unique property of polysaccharides because it does have hydrophilic polar bonds, but it can't react with water in the same way that other smaller molecules do. So here we're going to look at some structures uh, of some polymers. Uh, this won't be too, too crucial for your, it's just more to see some of the direct connections to how those structures look. Uh, when we look at those alpha linkages, uh, it's going to be a straight chain. It's going to be linear, especially if it's happening at that 1, 4 alpha, uh, pointing downward, so to speak, that hydroxyl group. And then there's another hydroxyl group up at the top that I've highlighted. Uh, as it continues, it's going to have that straight, straight chain. But because there is going to be some polar nature uh, due to those hydroxyl groups, it can kind of like form spirals, for lack of a better word. Uh, so we'll talk a bit more about that. But that starch can be stored... Uh, like that, those glucose uh, monosaccharides after a long polymerization process can be formed into starch, which is used to store nutrients in plants, as well as animals, but not so much. So when we look at this next one, uh, we see that there can be co some covalent bonds that form as a result, and that leads to some of the new structures that get formed, uh, and that leads itself to having another, again, that hel helical structure with regards to uh, those gluc glucose monomers. Again, after that long polymerization process, it can form some of those uh, hydrogen bonds or covalent bonds as a result of that polar nature. So this is with regards to glucose storage uh, in animals. And you'll start to see some similarities. Uh, the starch and glucose storage in plants and animals, the, the overall general 3D structure can be very similar, which is why we can use plant starch and break it down, reform it into to glucose, and then store it in our livers when, for, when we need that excess energy. And then when we look at some things as a result of the structure, we can think about some beta linkages because we looked at those alpha linkages above. 
Beta linkages allow for a different structure, and that different structure allows for the formation of cellulose, which we cannot digest because of its, uh, for lack of a better word, stacked structure. And that allows for fiber to get its tensile strength, as well as its uh, strength to protect plants from losing any type of nutrients or being harmed by any radiation or uh, any of the other environmental factors. So that that fiber that we can't digest, it's as a result of those beta linkages that form a new structure that is significantly tougher than what those alpha linkages form. And then lastly, we can look at something called chitin, which forms beta linkages in a different way. Um, whereas that plant fiber is that linear structure that chitin can have some side groups uh, that still beta linkages that polymerize it but the different functional groups that are attached allow for a, a different structure to form. Still quite strong and still, still very um, resistant, but it's again, it's gonna have that different structure. And as we look more at proteins and as we look more at enzymes, and we talk more about the structures at the, the single level and at the, the quaternary level, et cetera, uh, we'll start to understand how those structures are playing an important role. Okay, so that's it for this first lesson. Uh, I have a little activity here that you can answer some questions on, and I'm going to give you about 20 or 30-ish minutes to kind of go through that because ultimately this is a lot of information to digest, and I want to give you all the opportunity to kind of think about it and ask some questions before I move on to the next lesson. Uh, so I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to let you take a look at that activity and see if you can answer some of those questions and uh, ask questions if you have them yourself. All right, folks.